So, Em, oftentimes yep. in these podcasts we try to save these companies. Are we saying we can't save these guys and they're just in strife? I think they need some serious identity discovery. They should spit inside a tube and then find out what they're made of. <laughs> I've handballed that one to you. Hello and welcome to The Big Con, the podcast dedicated to demystifying and simplifying the world of strategy, exploring its impact on businesses and individuals who've either harnessed it for success or perhaps missed the mark. I'm Emily, Harvard graduate. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Question mark? I am Dale, <laughs> a big business student, self-proclaimed con aficionado. And we are bringing you in on the con, sharing the valuable lessons from both the failures and triumphs of those who've come before us. Now, I know, I wonder if our listeners, Dale, have picked up on the fact that I do the intro when it's your turn and then you do the intro <laughs> when it's my turn. So then if, if they are clued in to that little puzzle piece, they would be guessing that you have a story the, for us. It's the true meta of this podcast for <laughs> our devoted <laughs> listeners. Broken the fourth wall. Em, have you ever wondered what secrets your DNA might hold? Um, I guess. I personally would love to blame something else for my predisposition to eat an entire block of chocolate without knowing what happened, other than my lack of self-control, which apparently could be genetic. Today we're talking the original Hock Tour. Mass board resignations, a treasure trove of DNA, SPACs, Lizzo's 2019 Halloween outfit, the most daring CEO, and a whole bunch of misfortunes that has people asking whether or not this company can survive. We are diving into the story of 23 and Me, a direct-to-consumer company that sells DNA testing kits for ancestry, health, and trait insights. Right. Users, what they do is they provide their saliva sample. And the company analyzes the said spittle to reveal your origins and potential health predispositions. In late 2024, they're making headlines for all the wrong reasons. But let's not start at the end. Let's rewind to 2006. And what Jicky, Linda Avery, and Paul Cezesna come together in Mountain View, California, with a dream. They want to make genetic information accessible to individuals. Initially, they aimed to help people discover their ancestors, but they had far bigger ambitions. What could your DNA reveal about your potential health risks? And I want to talk about something special in the strategy world. Inflection points. These are the big societal changes, scientific developments, new technologies, or shifts in thinking that can give a business rocket boosters or reveal entirely new possibilities. Mm. More simply, it's when the stars align and that crazy idea that you had suddenly doesn't seem so crazy anymore. Let's take mm. Uber. For example, ride-sharing platforms couldn't actually exist without smartphones with GPS to pinpoint your location to nearby drivers. Yeah. Netflix would probably still be sending DVDs in the mail without high-speed internet. For 23andMe, their inflection point came in 2000 when scientists mapped 92% of the human genome, providing a comprehensive reference for human genetic information pretty much the source code for what makes humans us. In 2005, the introduction of next generation sequencing, which is again, just some technology and jargon stuff, paved the way for affordable genetic testing. Aha! 23andMe had their thing. The CEO described it as a paradigm shift. Silicon Valley speak for seizing an opportunity, but humbly added, oh, we were just in the right place at the right time. These founders had big dreams. And they couldn't have predicted how the public would embrace their idea. So in 2007, 23andMe launched their personal genome service, a direct-to-consumer genetic testing kit. Imagine this. You're at a family reunion. Your eccentric Aunt Sally pulls out a small tube. Let's all spit in this, she says. Fast forward a few weeks, and Aunt Sally is gleefully informing everyone that their great-grandpa's tales of royal ancestry were, let's just say, slightly exaggerated. But you can get the idea. It's funny you say that, Dale, because my mum's name is Sally. And she got one of these tests done. <laughs> yes. And she was like, oh, we're descendant from Marie Antoinette. Now, that's impossible because she had no descendants because they all died in the um, French Revolution. But um, she did have relatives. So we are a distant relative of Marie Antoinette, which is just a bit fun. And this is the kind of scene that has been set up inadvertently across living rooms in America. And 23 Me is currently very American-based. It was no longer just a product. It was becoming a cultural phenomenon, changing how we think about family history and our own genetic makeup. Reports claim that they sold 1,000 kits on the first day at $1,000 per kit. This is when they first launched. And they generated significant market attention. 
They offered something previously inaccessible to the general public, including information about predispositions to conditions like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, information that the medical community sometimes overlooked or withheld due to the lack of effective treatments. There's a bit of stigma and ethical considerations about this, and I'll try to touch on this very lightly. Interestingly, the Parkinson's testing was actually driven a lot by Anne's husband, Sergey Brin. People may remember that name because he's a co-founder of Google. He was keen to know if he carried the genetic mark for Parkinson's, and he was pretty sure that doctors weren't actually telling him with, about this information or weren't forthcoming with the information. Back to 23andMe and their big launch. It was flashy. Think Fashion Week parties, New York Times cover mm-hmm. stories, features in Wired magazine. The CEO described it as science fiction becoming reality. Suddenly, we could look inside the code inside of you. Sure. It's important to note there's the sensitive nature of genetic data, the potential for misuse. Imagine applying for a job and the company somehow knows you're at risk for a certain medical condition or Mm. you're facing higher insurance premiums due to your something else that's been found in your DNA. Despite these concerns, people largely looked past them and the kits kept on selling. Mm. Initially, sales started to decline a little bit, down to 15 or 20 kits a day. Not quite millions, but a start. And like many tech startups, the initial buzz didn't translate to sustained sales. So in a pivotal move, 23andMe decided to shake things up. They slashed the price of their kits to $99. And this resulted in 1,800 kits sold on the first day of that price change, clearing the inventory. As I said before, people are more likely to spit in a tube when it doesn't cost them a grand. With 20,000 odd people discovering their relation to Genghis Khan and potentially genetic quirks, 23andMe had found their product market fit. As the consumer base grew, they realized they were sitting on a gold mine, not just saliva, but data. Mm. This treasure trove of genetic information attracted $22 million in funding from Google, Johnson & Johnson of telecom powder fame, and other <clears throat> VC companies. 23andMe now held the largest stockpile of genetic data known to man. Mm. Their rapid growth didn't come without challenges. The medical industry, they were looking at what they were doing, and they grew quite uneasy with what um, 23andMe were kind of pursuing. And similar to much of the uh, the tech uh, world, the uh, Silicon Valley space, they were running pretty fast. They were citing concerns about untested genetic information. So 23andMe had largely bypassed the medical system and regulators weren't happy. In a reverse echo of like the Theranos scandal, the California Department of Health attempted to shut them down and they forced 23andMe to outsource their processing somewhere else. But all of a sudden, the final blow came in 2013 when the FDA the Food and Drug Agency, Food and Drug Agency in America. Yep. Administration. Administration. <laughs> Ordered them to cease operations. And to make matters worse, the FDA made their letter very public. Oh. It's the equivalent of a health code violation on your restaurant door. Interestingly, until this point, 23andMe had no experience dealing with regulators, which I actually think is pretty alarming considering they're offering yeah. um, what consumers would definitely interpret as medical diagnosis for the low, low cost of $99. But I digress. This is a business podcast. Em, put yourself mm-hmm. in Anne's shoes. FDA showdown coming at you. Millions in investment, thousands of customers, and a dream to revolutionize healthcare. Are you selling, walking away, fighting the FDA, or pivoting the business model? I think it depends on, like, I think you you maybe start first with conversations, like civilised conversations rather than notices with the relevant regulatory bodies potentially. And then if you're finding no cooperation there, probably pivot. Well, that's kind of what they did, which was good on you. Well done. You're a good, you're a season <laughs> CEO. Three votes to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I phrase it as 23 chose to fight. And what they, by fight, I mean they stayed in the game. And they complied with the FDA's demands. They lacked so much experience with regulatory agencies, so they had to bring in outside help. The FDA wanted to see everything. Of note, they only shut down the medical um, and genetic testing space, so they're still doing the Ancestry product at this stage. Mm -hmm. Well, the Ancestry stuff is like, you know, it, it's, it's, fun. it's almost like, yeah, it's fun. And it's like, it's not the Lower same, stakes. but you you can go see a psychic and they can tell you whatever they want and Correct. there's no consequences. Correct. So yeah. As opposed to someone being told they may have Alzheimer's and changing their Correct. entire way they live their life. Yes. The FDA, they want to see absolutely everything. Consumer reports, proof that consumers understood those reports. They even went as far as testing the consumers on their own genetic data, making them fill out an actual test on what the paper that they were receiving. 23andMe had to be an open book, revealing every test and every methodology that they did. 
and their efforts paid off. In 2015, mm-hmm. they relaunched under brand new conditions. Some of those conditions were pretty obvious. A very a clearer user interface had to put in educational tools like a share and compare functionality and a very prominent health disclaimer. The new family relationship with the FDA led to collaboration on genetic health risk reports, so more of them. It was actually something that really strengthened them further. It means they're mm-hmm. able to do FDA-authorized reports on conditions like type 2 diabetes. Mm-hmm. So some of these things kind of actually helped, like going through the long way, doing the work properly, helped 23 me. Well, I think actually now that I think back on it, I missed asking a really fundamental question around what do we do next? And one of those questions is, do you believe in the product? Because it sounds like that this product, they did, they believed in it. And so we're able to go through these sort of, this sort of rigmarole. Which is funny you mentioned that because this is where the stormy seas are coming. Oh no. Soon. (laughs) Because they're still in the heyday. They've just got regulatory approval. And this kind of bought legitimacy to 23andMe, as much legitimacy as spitting in a tube can bring. Consumers were busy discovering their ancestral roots. 23andMe was planting the seeds for something much bigger. They had now a million data records on file, and they were ready to start that next big project, the one they promised the investors, medical research. This move into research partnerships Mm -hmm. with pharmaceutical companies was a bit controversial. Most of us experience some form of data breach now, which feels yucky. It feels terrible. So imagine your genetic data infinitely more personal, or at least it feels infinitely more personal than your credit card details, being shared for drug discovery. It was a really tricky tightrope to walk, but Mm. Walker, they did. And I said they initially partnered with big pharma companies. They found they had a lack of expertise in genomic knowledge, which is something very interesting. They didn't have it in-house or in-house, and so they decided to build it in-house, a whole new therapeutics division, complete with labs and pipettes. And actually a lot of people were asking them and going, are you sure? Is Is this in line with your business? The new team lead noted that on his first day, so the new guy was coming in to set up the big therapeutics division, the closest thing that 23andMe had to a lab at the time was the kitchen. So they weren't overly prepared, but they dived in head first. They continued to build their genetic database, reaching almost 14 million samples. I want you to take note of these numbers. They also hit peak brand awareness. Eddie Murphy is talking about them on Saturday Night Live. Lizzo dressed as a testing kit for Halloween, and they scored a golden goose of consumer products, a spot on Oprah's favourite things. But the glory days were now over. Sales flatlined. First off, people started to grow wary of data theft, and competition Mm -hmm. from other companies like Ancestry.com, who are offering similar things, were taking some of the market share. We've seen this story before. 14% 14% workforce reduction, 100 of the 23andMe staff completely laid off and a return to basics for their products. I find it mm. interesting that these products fight for so long for their original purpose, the testing kit, and being able to provide that only to reach market saturation and then not having to actually protect what their moat is in that space. So what's a tried and true model for innovation plays or tech companies when you're trying to lock in some repeat revenue? I wonder if you can guess. Subscriptions. Bing, 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 bing. Yay! <laughs> and I shit you not, it's called 23andMe Plus. How does this work, you ask? <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> well, come on, guys. Hi, oh, marketing company. That. How does this work, you ask? <laughs> Do your genetics change? No, but you can start selling other wellness products alongside it, perhaps through telehealth. Now, This is about 2019, and telehealth actually wasn't commonplace at the time. But guess what happened? The pandemic, another inflection point, making doctor's appointments via Zoom the complete norm. And 23andMe went as far as acquiring a telehealth company, Lemonade, to run this new business, opening up 23andMe to all 50 states with an accompanying pharmacy. They also added other features like relative matches and educational platforms, et cetera, et cetera. So 23andMe Plus did have some functionality in it, limited might be. In 2021, they went public on the NASDAQ at a $3.5 billion valuation through a SPAC, which is a special purpose acquisition company. Now, we've spoken about SPACs before, and I've glossed over them because I didn't understand them. I now understand them. So for those needing a refresher, a SPAC is where investors, in this case, includes Richard Branson of Virgin Fame, form a company on the stock market, like a shell company. It's got no operations or products. It's purely a space to pool money. This cash field shell company then looks for a private company to invest in or acquire here, 23andMe. Voila, the private company goes public through the merger that skips the lengthy IPO process. 
This is a quite a popular move from 2019 to 2023, with companies like WeWork, Virgin Galactic, and DraftKings taking this route. It is worth noting that there may be a correlation between companies that SPAC and those that perhaps don't perform as well as they could. Perhaps all that IPO paperwork serves a purpose after all. For 23 May, it initially seems great. The company's market value soared to 6.4 billion USD, roughly equivalent to a Qantas or a JB Hi-Fi for our Australian listeners. But why is it now worth just $200 million and facing potential oh, delisting? Oh, no. I have some theories. In whatever the opposite of an inflection point is, this is what happened to 23 May because they had a major data breach. It didn't help the situation. It impacted more than half of its users. We've covered data breaches before. Hackers apparently access display names, relationships between 23ME members, shared data amounts, and chromosome details. These cyber criminals now had personal information like emails and potentially knew if users were 0.01% Neanderthal. Not good. 23ME handled the breach quite poorly, like many companies did at the time, and things only got worse and they're now facing a $30 million class action lawsuit. Add to that the inability to achieve cash flow positivity, and they've got a recipe for a lot of trouble. Mm. Remember that in-house drug discovery lab, the really exciting one? In August 2024, it was shut down, incredibly mm. expensive, and described as fruitless. Mm. More recently, every board member decided to play musical chairs, except no one sat back down because all directors resigned. They all cited disagreements with Anne Wojcicki, and particularly her strategic direction leaving her very much alone at the helm. They're still trying. The telemedicine arm has jumped in on the current fad, offering semaglutide injections, think Ozempic, for $2.99, along with a $49 monthly weight loss plan subscription. They also offer a total health platform with comprehensive genetic testing, blood screening, and a clinical care team, so they are still trying to improve the products. Based on the website, they can address other things like anxiety, depression, and erectile dysfunction, and I almost got into a telehealth call last night doing the research for this episode. <laughs> However, there's criticism about the barrier to entry being too high. For instance, $119 for the standalone test plus the subscription cost, it's a bit much. And the buzz around genetic testing has completely faded, leaving mm. fewer potential customers for these offerings. Some reports suggest that these actionable health advice wasn't updated and it wasn't valuable. So 23andMe and Plus is a bit of a bust. What's next for 23andMe? Anne wants to take it private again and is looking for buyers. And I wish her luck. I'm not actually sure that there's much of a company left to take. So let's, when we come back, discuss what to do when you realize your company's main product isn't as enduring as you thought, yeah. how to handle a mass exodus of your team, and whether 23andMe might need to rebrand to 23 and Who. Welcome back. 23andMe, would you, knowing what you know now, just do it for fun? Like, I know you've got your old mate. Mary Mom. Antoinette relative, but yeah. like I guess that's that's the other thing. Like surely if one person does it in your family, you, you're filling in half the family tree. So yeah, it's half. Yeah, mm. um, <laughs> that's that is how that's how bodies work. Um, yeah. DNA. <laughs> I think that's the main thing here is though they don't have. It's a product with very very limited repeat appeal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You you don't use it again because once you know, you know. And that's the gimmick. That's that's to get you in the front door. I think that there's a really interesting thread that sort of goes with Twenty Three and Me. How they started, what the main business was, what their passion was, and what they wanted to do, and where they wanted to go. I think we're all a bit confused. Like. I don't think they really understood who they were. Like when you start a business, right, it's really risky. Like it's really risky. We talk about business failures all the time and there's no sign of us running dry on material. Like, like business 85% fails. of statistics are made up, but I know that something like <laughs> 90% of businesses fail in the first year or something, it's some absurdly so, high stat. It's ridiculous. It's yeah. such a... Um, and when you're starting up a business that has to have such a big infrastructure like testing facilities, it's a massive risk. And so the reason that the most compelling reason for these people to get into this business that you cited was to find those markers, to find those genetic markers um, and a trusted affordable, accessible way to find those markers. I personally don't want to know because I don't want mm. it to impact the way. There I is very, there's two schools of thought in this. There's the people who are blissfully ignorant until it 
hits it, hits it like an anvil and those who want to do everything to be able to protect. I don't actually know where I see it. Like, yeah. I, I think I would, I feel like I would want to peel back the, the curtain and then live in regret that I peel back the curtain knowing me. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's very interesting from the genetic standpoint. Yeah. And like, so, but that, but there are people that want to find that. So there is a market there for sure. So, but then I guess like part of it, the ancestry thing, I guess a gimmicky part of it to mm. find out. I mean, yes and no, there are like some people want to go down the ancestry trail for really personal reasons, such mm-hmm. as potentially they're adopted and mm-hmm. they want to find out more about um, who they are genetically. Um, you know, so there are real, um, you know. Between you and me though, I'm not using $99 service for that. I'd be doing something a little bit more what feels legitimate. Depends if it's trusted, but now you know that all the FDA approval and yeah, stuff they right. went through, you would do, you would do it. So it's it does have like the brand recognition, would, yeah, a hundred percent. So you can go, oh, this is really trusted, and they can put their FDA approvals everywhere and all this sort of stuff. I think maybe potentially an issue, and they say it's which is so funny because it can be so contradictory when it comes to running a business. But it's like always know where you're heading and always um, know how to grow and to and to understand when your market dries up and all that kind of stuff. But I wonder, Dale, if they were thinking maybe too far ahead and trying to jump to the next phase before they really solidified themselves as a trusted provider or I think there's probably two bits to think there because they're a loss making business in the initial like my mm. assumption is that the average genetic test is going to be more than $99 and so they're banking mm. on the fact that they'll be able to convert whatever genetic information they have into data and that's where the value is mm. I wonder in terms of when they were doing that component so I think you're right I think they were like cool that's the end goal we're going to build this giant genetic database to get that genetic database, they need to continue to funnel in data. And when they've reached that market saturation, mm. there was probably opportunity to make more um, that product more valuable. So I actually don't think that telehealth product offering and 23ME Plus was a bad idea. I just mm. think it was at a too late point. Because yeah. You've got all these people, you've got these 14 million people who have engaged the platform from 2013 to 2019 who have got their fund, they've got the gimmick, they've got, they spent the upfront $99. Yeah. But then they've left. And so they actually, it's a struggle to reconvert them into other product offerings because they've already had the fun thing where they found out who their uncle is. And yeah. so I think, yes, they were too slow in trying to actually monetize the front end and we're thinking mm. very much around like, okay, the end goal is genetic testing, is to be able to somehow create a drug that's going to cure Alzheimer's because the assumption was, and the line of thinking they were going with, was the genetic medication and treatments and therapies that were linked to DNA was going to be more successful than your average, like, off-the-shelf mm. average drugs. And there is um, scientific proof for that. But I think you're right. I think they were going too slow around, cool, there will always be customers. There will always be someone who wants to spit in a tube and and until there wasn't. And not being able to improve upon that, their funnel has dried up. They branched out into so many different areas. There was this confusion and we talk about, you know, leaning on your strengths and I think they just maybe needed to do an old-fashioned SWOT analysis, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> like, like, who are you? What are your strengths? What are you going on? Because your strengths are not building a laboratory where you have no experts in this field And spending all this money, like what are your strengths? So maybe their strengths were they've now built up this 23andMe brand. Oh, yeah, true. And, and, you know, people know who they are. Do they want to push more into front end people and have and partner with laboratories? Or I think that they got sort of maybe a bit ahead of themselves and just wanted to do it all. There's always a a hubris of like, we beat the FDA, we won, and we're going to wear that badge of the pride and we still don't need the medical industry. We did this without the medical industry. Yeah, but like this, and this I think is the fundamentally wrong attitude. The FDA aren't people to beat. They are people that have regulations, whether they're well established or misguided regardless of your opinion of the FDA they exist to regulate things so that people don't get duped <laughs> and they or don't hurt or, or hurt or yeah. you know it's 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 they're not someone to beat their tests they're 
there to ensure that people are providing a good product. So if you've got a good product, go for it. I think the other thing about this business is that they went from something that was quite mundane in Mm. terms of like, or, you know, a gimmicky, which is like, hey, you're Marie Antoinette's blah, 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 to mining genetic data. And that's that's a really big jump. <laughs> it starts to impact the brand components there because you're not the lovely company who's going to give you a family tree, but you're the one who's like selling it to a, another company and you get start to get a bit a bit concerned. Yep. I was watching an episode of The Good Fight the other day and that was one of the legal cases there uh, in terms of someone felt they were getting unfair insurance premiums because of that. And again, there's no record of that happening. Yep. But it is something in the back of people's mind in the zeitgeist that people go, oh, my God, that's that's right. Someone could someone could unfairly treat me because they know something about me that um, they shouldn't. So having your whole leadership team leave, mm. how do you come back from that? How do you, when you've so, gone in and said this is a new vision, what do you do in that space? Like how do you, there's, there's, there's a, like from a PR perspective, you can't control that narrative. That's a, no. something you have to own up, up to. It's too late by then. Because the, the there will have been writings on the wall way before you have a mass exodus. That is not the sign that you go, oh, my God, now we've got to do something about how we're operating because obviously something's gone wrong. There's got to be a million other signs. It's like, Dale, you've got two tiny children. If there gets to be a huge tantrum and a scream, there are signs... Usually- before it's that, usually that seven you just o'clock ignore. and they haven't had a nap today and you're like, oh, God, I should have put them down long, longer. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's like it doesn't – nobody just goes from zero to I'm out of here. Like, do you mm. know what I mean? Like because they made one decision. Oh, well, mm. then I'm leaving. That's not how it works. If you have trust in the company and the leadership and they make a decision that you question, there should be an ability for you to follow up understand why, blah, 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 there's going to have to have been signs prior to that that you completely missed, like um, maybe tension in meetings, maybe Mm. um, slow but sure disengagement. There are little things that are really important indicators because a lot of the time your employees aren't coming to you going, I have a problem, they just slowly disengage if you are not providing a platform for them to speak up. And I think maybe that's probably what happened in that. Well, actually, we'll never know what happened inside that boardroom. But it's very interesting that what happened was there wasn't a dethroning like we saw with the ChatGPT situation where they asked the CEO. Yeah. That shows a real lack of faith in the entire product when everyone's like, I I can't put my name on this as a director anymore. I'm not going to be on this board anymore. I need to leave. And so I, I, I actually don't have a good answer around how you navigate this. What was this. the product? By the time they all left, what was the product? I don't know. I'm confused. It seems more like it's a telehealth product now. Like that's where the pivot is. They've just gone to this telehealth but product. But you just where said it seems like, I, you know, that's not good. <laughs> and this is where I was going back to, even if you go back to what was the gimmicky product around the Ancestry.com product, in Australia you can get that for $50 or a 14-day free trial. So there's like even from a cost perspective, the gimmick that got people in the front door is not there anymore. So, Em, oftentimes in these podcasts we try to save these companies. Are we saying we can't save these guys and they're just in strife? I don't know because I'm never, I'm always, I'm always always reluctant to really throw some, like I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think they need some serious identity discovery. They should spit inside a tube. And then find out what they're made of. <laughs> I really, I, I went like that for you, didn't I? I've handballed that one to you. They really need to figure out who they are, ironically, because that it's it's unclear. My final comment is, and I did a lot of research on from the CEO speaking, and I was, and I realized I was I'm like, I wonder how much is of the truth of the company, and how much of it is the Silicon Valley. We're going to change the world. Speak. And mm. how much maybe that got in the way of the mission mm. and vision and the actual mm. operations. Sometimes you've got to do the work and you can't just be speaking about your mission and vision the whole time. Hubris is 
you know, what goeth before the fall, which is an amalgamation of a few different sayings. I believe you. And I'm really serious. I would happily fade to black on that note. (laughs) Well, listeners, there you have it. You now understand a little bit more of the con. And we hope that you um, can find out whether you're related to Genghis Khan in the future. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Big Con podcast. It not only supports us, but it means you will get all the latest episodes straight to your device. And don't keep all the fun to yourself either. Share the con around your mother, your aunt, your best friend's brother, and tell them to check us out on all their favourite podcast apps. For any further details, head over to our website, thebigconsultingagency.com, and sign up to the mailing list. Bye for now. See ya. This podcast was recorded on the lands of the Woi Wurrung Language Group. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land.